Nice to meet you, Evan. Uh, and Gordon. Gordon. Nice to meet you, Gordon. Uh, so, um, let me start by, uh, hopefully we can just discuss this and, and then get something out of it. Um, start with Evan. Did you have any interest in electronics or gadgets when you were a young man or a boy? Uh, was it kind of thing, the kind of thing you started on? Yeah, so I, so I had a BBC Micro when mm. I was a kid. Um, I had a ZX81 briefly when I was a kid, but I got a second hand off a friend, but it didn't work. Um, well, I couldn't make it work. I got a BBC Micro because I've had a BBC Micro at school, so I bought one of those. I had good times with all of them. Did his ZX81 have like, one of those ramp packs used to fall it off? It didn't have a lot, but I mean, it, it didn't yeah. go so far as working well enough. Well, I just came back from Linuxcon and we were looking at Colt, Colt Commodore 64 hardware. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a beep, I was a beep guy, and um, I, I, I bought, bought my, BBC, my BBC 220 pounds, second round, Model A upgraded to Model B RAM, uh, 4080 track, double sided. Disk drive. <gasps> you had a disk drive. I had a disk drive. So, but this was 1988, so this was a really, really, really second-hand BBC. Had to hit it on the top to make it, it boot up. So I did a lot of so I did a lot of software stuff, and I had that and I had an Amiga. Uh, and I never really did much in the way of electronics yeah. uh, as a kid. Mm. Uh, and I only really got into that in my, I guess, late twenties, mid to late twenties mm. after I finished my PhD. Yeah, you were similar kind of thing. Or? Yeah, I mean, I, so I had a BBC Micro, but a little bit earlier than Evan, slightly older. So, um, and I probably got into electronics a lot earlier. I think my dad gave me a TV and a soldering iron and said, "Take it apart." Yeah. Um, I that's you what know, I ended up throwing it in the bit because it never, you know, never. That's what happened to me when I was a boy at soldering iron. Get on with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and then uh, I did some things like I, I remember once creating a. It was actually, it was one of those, so we were saying before about Electronics Today International, they actually had something in there which was basically a voice digitizer for a BBC Micro. And all it was was basically a, a, you know, a comparator. Yeah. So you just output a, a slowly incrementing counter, and a com you know, then you have your, 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 your DAC and a, count and a counter, and a comparator. Um, yeah. And we did that, you know, that kind of stuff when, you know, that was at school, that was in the, the mid-80s. So. Mm. It's the way you learn, I suppose. Yeah. You've got to learn, got to start somewhere. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, Evan? What made you uh, take a degree in physics and engineering at the University of Cambridge? Um, so, so I came up to read physics. Um, I guess I enjoyed physics at school. Um, I had a, I had this kind of weird idea that um, I didn't want to do. I really enjoyed computer programming, right? I had, I had this weird idea that I didn't want to do that for my degree. That I wanted to do something else. Uh, I didn't want to do the thing that I, that I did for fun. I did in the first year here do, one of the nice things about Cambridge is that you can choose to do some computer science even if you're doing another course. So I did 25% computer science in the first year, and then I dropped that and went to physics, mm. and then I dropped that and went and did engineering. I think I did engineering because I had a friend who spoke very highly of the course. Yeah. Uh, it's what we call the, I don't think it exists anymore, but it was called the Electrical and Information Sciences Tripos, the IST. Yeah, I heard about that one, yes. Yeah. And so it was a really good course, and it was a four year, so it was a it was a four-year course and you could transfer in halfway, so I transferred in after two years. Mm. It was a four-year master's course. Um, and I dropped out after three years to run my first startup. Yeah, um, well, some people have to do these things. And never, never look back. Mm. And then you went on to take a degree in, uh, take a degree in diploma in computing science. Yeah, the, the diploma is the, the diploma's not a defunct course now. It was actually yeah. the, it was the oldest taught course. It used to be, I think, the diploma in uh, numerical analysis and methods or something, it's, it's a dates back to the 1950s, it was the earliest um, taught course in computer science in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of a lot of cool people have done, uh, have done that course. I've got a Wikipedia page. Yeah, I met a few people in Manchester yeah. Computer Centre who did the same, same yeah. course or something. Yeah. And it's kind of, effectively what it, is, what it was, was a repackaging of a um, of uh, some of the undergraduate courses into a postgraduate conversion course. Mm -hmm. So when I came back after selling my startup, I, I, I did it's great, it's a really good course. Mm -hmm. went straight up to a PhD after. So you, did you do your degree in Cambridge or? No, I went. I was at York actually. Yeah. Uh, so because I, I recently well, I, went to York. I studied chemistry there at York. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I did electronics at York. Mm. Um, although actually, I didn't go direct. I actually went did a apprenticeship for the Ministry of Defence mm. uh, for four years before that, and then went off to York. So. Oh, right. um, yeah. So. Useful was, place. It was, an, a, a, it, was a, it was a great place, yeah, yeah. and I did a PhD after that, so I was there for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Evan, uh, Broadcom, Broadcom uh, what was the reason you went to work for them? Was it just handy, or you just fitted in? Or? Well, I had, a fr I had a friend, so my office mate, a um, guy called Neil Johnson, um, was my office mate when 
when I was doing my PhD at Cambridge, and he was a year ahead of me on the on the on the PhD, and he uh, he kept telling me how much fun um, Broadcom was. Well, first of all, he used to work for a company called Cambridge Consultants after he finished his after he finished his, and he used to tell me how much fun Cambridge Consultants was, and then he went to work for Broadcom and told, yeah. kept telling me how much fun Broadcom was and how much I, I should totally go for a, go and apply for a job there. And what I didn't know was that there's a referral. I didn't know yeah. there was a referral <laughs> bonus yeah. at both of these companies, <laughs> so he was not exactly a completely impartial um, source. So no, I went along to. Um, I basically went on for an interview there. I went to an open evening and I went for an interview to show him up. Um, yeah, and, and I my, into it. Yeah, and I, and I got badgered into it. And I went along to the interview. I was nearly late. I was, I'd got into electronics at that point and I was out working with this guy um, uh, who I know who builds um, low voltage motor controllers um, for, for wheelchairs. He used to do a lot of stuff for robot wheels. And I was building, I designed him some new digital motor controls. I was building them and I was wearing the scruffy clothes for soldering. I was coming in my bits of sold the flags all over my clothes. I looked at my watch and I was due to go for an interview at 10 o'clock and it was quarter to 10 and I was about 15 <laughs> miles away. So I drove like blazes. Um, got there you know, one minute before, um, totally not paying any attention. And I went in for an interview to shut him up. And I came out at the end of the interview desperate for them to call me. Yeah. Do because you think that, of the people who I met. Do you think working at Broadcom actually did a lot for you? Is it that Absolutely. Kind of, that kind of place? It's a great place. I mean, yeah. yeah. I always heard that. I always heard that it was great to go yeah. there too. It is an amazing. It is an amazing company. Mm. Um, yeah. When I when I arrived at Broadcom, one thing I always found was that uh, the amazing thing about Broadcom was the just the density of really clever people. Yes. And the scarcity of of kind of mm -hmm. mediocre. Yeah. People. I've seen similar things in Silicon Valley in California because yeah. I, I did a, I went out there to study. Mm -hmm. And you meet people who can just do things. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's just not possible. They'll just do it in front of you. Yeah. So Gordon, Gordon had arrived uh, you, about, you, a about a month before you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we were kind of new boys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so we, we joined fairly shortly after the. So about eighteen months before we joined, um, Broadcom had acquired the office, and Broadcom tends to tends to uh, buy a lot of companies, tends to grow by acquisition, yeah. and it had bought Alpha Mosaic, which is an unlikely startup, and so we were some of the earliest people. Okay, uh, moving along to Intel, you've been a, a visiting researcher at Intel. Mm -hmm. Did you get anything really good out of that, or was it? Um, so what did I do? I did some work on something called Haggle, which was a, um, uh, an ad hoc networking um, yeah. uh, technology that used um, uh, intermittent Bluetooth communications between other devices to, uh, uh, to to transport data to sort of try and do best effort um, transport data grounds, uh, yeah. sort of slow transport data grounds, which was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, I wrote a thing called Blue Cove, which was um, which is still in use. It's uh, an implementation of JSR. I think JSR, what it, whichever JSR it is, which is the mapping of Bluetooth into Java, mm. uh, which is part of the J2ME standard. I wrote a desktop J, J, uh, Java SE implementation mm. called Blue Cove, which I was rather pleased to see the other day. Someone posted a question about on uh, the forums. Okay. Somebody trying to get Blue Cove working on the Pi. Right. And you look at it, and the whole thing has been being developed. This was in 2004, and the whole thing has been being developed continuously since 2004. Well, at least, this There's is this enormous you, list of contributors, and why not? Well, at least this is something to do with open source software. Yeah. As long as yeah. you don't get run over by patent trolls, then things tend, yeah. tend to just go along nicely. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. And, you know, if you build um, something interesting. So that was, that was good. Um, yeah, those are the main things. I think I was trying to, I went in there trying to build um, some sort of. I was trying to do something clever with type systems um, and type to assembly language and stuff, but I got sidetracked into doing networking. It was kind of fun. It was a wonderful lab, but it was, not, it was a very, a very short-lived experiment. This, this yeah. um, Intel lab at the university here. But yeah. it was good fun. Uh, you get things like that at British universities that may not last too long. Yeah. I remember the Wine, is it Wine computers at the University of Stirling didn't last long. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we better not talk about that. Um, Raspberry Pi, Pi Foundation. Can can you tell me anything about it or? Um, Would you like to say something about it? Or? It's a, it's it's what it looks like. It's a it's a charity. Mm. Um, its its mission is its mission is not to build a very large number of small computers. Its mission is to get more children uh, computing. And the, this is it. I mean, part of the thing with Pi is become very popular in educational circles. Yeah. and it's great for that for that and, and purpose. It's, it's that superb tool, yeah. educational tool. Um, but more about the rest of the foundation. So the, found, so the foundation's <laughs> mission is to get more children computing by any means necessary. I mean, it just turns out that a little computer is a, uh, is a particularly good way of doing that. Um, yeah, so we've been running since 2009. Um, we've been really running since about 2011. So we had a sort of two-year quiet period at the start where we tried to figure out what we were going to do. Um, 
based here out of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it was, it was, I think it's done some fun stuff. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll quickly skip over to the, uh, the other part, which is uh, what do you think about the future of uh, Raspberry Pi? Uh, where do you see it going to? I mean, at the moment, it's a raging success. Yeah. But obviously, it's going to become more successful. Well, this is it. Yes. It was a trick question. Not really. So no. It's going it's it, to it, decline. It's a mediocre realm. You only have to look at the BBC yeah. Micro yeah. and the Sinclair computer yeah. to see which way it's going. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any visions for the future or anything. Uh, uh, well, we want to make the software better. I mean, yeah. I think that that goes without saying. I think that there's, you know, the nice thing that we've discovered is we've got this, got this platform, mm -hmm. and it's a fixed, it's a fixed target, and it's really worth our spending money, and we do spend a lot of money now on yeah. making the software platform for that better. Yeah. So it's really mostly, I think, it's a software, it's a software story, yeah. at least for the next, for the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's about really trying to kind of tighten the nuts on it and just yeah. get a little, get more performance out of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Trying to turn it into something like a, almost like a building block system, so that people can take our our libraries and we, we're trying to create libraries and, and improve libraries so that people can just take the you know take the libraries, have a look, a bit like the the, the ETI magazine we used to flick through and think some ideas and put them together. And that's kind of what we want to do is put some money into the software so that those blocks already work. Yeah. So somebody can just say, I've got this idea for whatever it is and they can go, well I can use this library and that one and this one. They all work and I've got this demo application I can just go make. It runs and and you know all I have to do is just you know take some of that bit, pull that to the, with that you know and throw it together and oh I've got this new application isn't that great? Yeah, that's something I think we're trying to, to push for is to, you know just to take, like a say, take a brilliant idea and make it better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Try to find out what the users want and then invest. You know, we have money to invest. Try and find out what the users want and invest in the things that are meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. So a really good example of this is small talk. I mean, I guess small talk is kind of a minority but interest language, but the interesting thing about it is there's a vast amount of educational software written to Smalltalk, in particular Scratch, which a lot of, a lot of people use for teaching young kids. Yeah. So we've been spending a, a surprisingly large amount of time and money on making Smalltalk run really, really well to buy. And there's, there's probably four or five of those things where there are either things which are um, obvious bits of system level infrastructure that we want to improve, that are, you know, something like making the web browser better is something that's obviously going to benefit so there are some things which are just obvious, smack your interface obvious, and then there are a number of things which have been where we've gone out to the community and we found out, you know, people want to be able to do fast Fourier transforms very fast, or people want to be able to run small talk very fast, or people want to be able to do a particular kind of image processing. Uh, and those things are, you know, those, those places where we can take a bit of community input and bring you know, foundations and resources to bear out. Okay, well, cool. thanks very much. Uh, we'll have to leave at that point, but awesome. thanks, thanks for your help. Fun thing. So this is the this, that's a Raspberry Pi behind my hand here, um, and this is a um, this thing here is a um, five megapixel camera. That oh, we, brilliant! That yeah. We, we produce for the Pi. We don't really produce very much in the way of add-on um, of add-on hardware for the Pi. We tend to think the community is uh, yeah. is a better source of that stuff. Um, but the camera, for a variety of reasons, it requires a certain amount of intervention inside the Pi firmware yes. um, to, to to make it work properly. And so this is something that we probably do better than somebody else. So that's the camera board. Been in the market for about four months. We've sold about seventy or eighty thousand of those. Uh, do you have any favourite uh, Pi projects? I've been. Yeah, we do. Um, well, I do. What's your favourite Pi project? My favourite Pi project must be the pinball machine um, at Family Lab. <laughs> that is quite cool. Though. <laughs> they need to do a better video of it because it's kind of hard. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. No, okay. awesome it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, that's fun. Um, the uh, uh, my favourite ones are all the space ones. So the astrophotography. Yeah. Mom's the uh, the chuck in the barrel.